Join us, friends. Great Scott Spa Guy. Do they know what we have in store for them? They will if they tighten up. And don't double dribble. To the Grey Ghost Spa Guy? Exactly, old chum. No time to waste. To the Grey Ghost. We have not a minute to spare. It's showtime, friends. All right. I have messed this up. <laughs> There's Trey. I am the Spa Guy, and this is... I'm globe trotting with Trey. <laughs> and we are not wishing Cotton was a monkey. And I'm sorry, guys. I messed that little intro up. On here, it's not automated. I have to go click, 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 click. And when I take my glasses off, I can no longer see my computer. So I had a little little thing there. But yeah, the we're spy gonna guy, that. go ahead. The spy guy double dribble today. So I indeed did double dribble. But we're not going to let that stop us. Today we have a special guest. It's a good friend of mine good friend of Trey's, uh, Rob Moss. And a lot of people would say that the American dream is dead. And I say that the American dream is still very, very much alive. And we're going to talk to Rob about, he had a goal. He had an idea of something that he wanted to do. And he set out to do it. And friends, he actually did it. So let's bring Rob in right here. Come on, Rob. Let's bring you into the stream. This is my friend, Rob Moss. Hey, guys. How y'all doing? And Rob um, lives in North Carolina in NASCAR country. So, Rob, you set out to work for NASCAR. Right. Did that happen? It did. It about killed me, but it did happen, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, tell us about that. Tell us how you set your sights on that and, and actually went after working for a NASCAR team and ended up working for a lot of NASCAR teams. And you have uh, championship rings to prove it, right? Right, I do. With my name, my name embossed on the side, so there's no doubt it was me. All right, well that's cool. So tell us about how you got to that, uh, how that became a goal, and what you had to do to to get there. And I'm sure there was sacrifices along the way and all kinds of stuff. Right, absolutely, there was. And to to be honest with you, looking back now of the sacrifices and how hard it was. I probably wouldn't have done it again if I could go back because it really was very, very difficult, uh, more so than I ever thought it was going to be. Um, so basically, I'll tell you how it started in the beginning. Uh, I'm born and raised Shreveport, Bossier City, Louisiana, uh, born in 1968, you know, went to school there, graduated, decided I didn't want to be ordinary. I didn't want an ordinary job. My dad worked at General Electric. He had a great job. He was a great provider. He wanted me to go work with him there, but I just... I just had this need. I wanted to be something other than that. Um, so at the time, I was uh, working for a job a company called Roadway Package System. It was like a UPS kind of competitor. And I had I was a contractor. I had two other trucks under me. I had two subcontractors working. I was making six figures a year. I had a wife, uh, two stepkids, two Great Danes, and a cat. And we had a nice little house. They went to private school. I had I had you know five or six cars. I mean, it was really a good time for me, but I just decided I wanted to do something else. So I went to the Texas uh, NASCAR track. Uh, I was working on a, a top fuel car and a funny car for free on the side for a friend of mine. And when I was there, I met a fella who was moving to Mooresville, North Carolina to start an ARCA team. And over the course of three days, I got to know him and talking to him. And he was telling me, man, you should think about doing NASCAR because you can make a lot of money, be on TV, be famous, all this, all this other stuff that really appealed to me in my early 20s. And so I did. I put my house up for sale, uh, sold it the day it went on the market, uh, got a budget rental truck, made like four trips myself uh, and loaded myself and moved myself. My wife at the time, uh, two stepchildren, two great dames of the cat, to Mooresville, North Carolina, and didn't know soul. Had never been to Mooresville, didn't know anything about it. Um, and that's where that's where the the the, uh, the hardships began, um, because I thought, you know, my buddy said, "Hey, come on, man, I can get you get you interviews and all this and that." Well, as it turned out, if you don't know someone or you're not related to someone, it's very difficult to get anybody to talk to you. And you can have qualifications as long as you're armed. But if you don't have a name to attach with it, nobody cares. So, you know, I would go interview at a couple of places and they wouldn't even pay wouldn't even make eye contact with me, wouldn't talk to me. Now, and this is the day before HR departments and resumes and all that. NASCAR was still at that time pretty much you pick up the phone and call. If you know somebody, you start work on Monday or whatever. It's the good old boy system. 
it was a good old boy system back then. And I was, I was unprepared for that. I didn't know that. So I'd show up, you know, with my dress shirt tucked into my pants with a resume and all this. And these people look at me coming across the parking lot, like, who is this guy? You know, I was damned, excuse my French before I even walked into the door. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I had promised the wife, the stepkids and the two great Danes and the cat that I was going to be successful. We were going to have plenty of money and, we had we actually had to sell one of my cars, so I was down to one vehicle. Uh, I had to get a job work delivering pizza at Domino's during the day. I had a newspaper route at night. I sold cars at a Honda dealership up in Statesville, and the worst part of that was I would be in the parking lot with my tie on, sweating, trying to sell a Honda Civic, and right across the road was Interstate 77, and I would see the NASCAR transporters going up and down the road. So it was in my face all the time. Um, and I had just, I had wrote a lot of checks that I couldn't cash at that point because I had, and I could see the disappointment in my family's eyes because it just wasn't going anywhere. So, um, and a lot of the teams, a lot of times teams would tell me, say, man, too bad you don't have a CDL because if you had a CDL, we need a backup truck driver. We would have hired you. So I went and put an application in with Schneider Trucking in Charlotte and got a job with Schneider. They paid for my training. I got my free CEO. I had to go over the road for a few months, um, you know, to get some experience. Uh, I left there, and that still didn't work. So I got a job at Coca-Cola. So I'm working at Coca-Cola. I put my NASCAR dreams off to the side. I said, you know, I got a 401K, you know, vacation pay, good benefits. My wife's happy now. You know, we, we're getting back on track again. Well, I still had that itch. You know, because Coca-Cola is a huge sponsor of NASCAR. So, you know, y'all see the Earnhardt banners. I see all this stuff up and everything. Um, so I decided to help a guy work on his dirt uh, race car at night. And he got me into some NASCAR shops working for free. And when I say work for free, cleaning bathrooms, cleaning out the refrigerators, cutting the grass. I would show up in my Coke uniform because I'd get off work at Coke, go straight to the race shop. And those guys wouldn't talk to me. They wouldn't give me a time of day. I was really like Cinderella. I, it was a, it was it was a bad time for me. But like I said, there again, I had written checks to the family that I needed to cash to be able to do. So I worked on the dirt car. Sometimes I'd work till midnight, go home. It was an hour drive to the house. Had to be packed up at five to go work for Coca Cola. It was it was a rough time. It really was. And this went on for almost two years. And so then the guy's dirt car I was working on. He also sold tools to a lot of the NASCAR teams, and he had a lot of respect. So one day he calls me on my cell phone and says, hey, man, I think I got you a job in NASCAR. And I'm like, "Okay, whatever. This time he says, go up to the Hot Wheels Craftsman truck team. He says, you know where it's at? I said, yeah, I do know where it's at. Oh, and I forgot one part. Part of my Coke route when I was a Coke driver was I delivered Cokes to Michael Waltrip's race shop to impact motorsports. So it was in my face all the time. I would walk in and load these machines up with Cokes wanting to be one of these guys on the team, you know. Um, So I knew exactly what shop he was talking about. And he said, well, when you go over there, and the guy that told me this was Dave Brakefield. He was very well known in NASCAR. Hopefully he's still alive. I don't know. But he said, go over to the race shop, the Hot Wheels truck team. And it was the Hot Wheels truck team, RC Cola, and the SuperGuard Craftsman truck team. He says, go find Randy Gillery uh, and tell Randy Gillery Dave Brakefield sent you. And I'm like, dude. That's not going to work. I mean, I tried everything. Nothing's going. I didn't tell him that, but I was thinking that. And honestly, the, uh, I'm sorry to stop you. So you said he was a tool guy, right? So Snap On Mac, uh, SX Tools. SX. Okay, so that would be more NASCAR related things, right? He would show up. He had a, had a portable truck, you know, a, a P600, P700 truck. Okay, so just he like would, Snap On and Mac. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like I said, all the guys liked him. He was a great guy. He raced a dirt lake model on the side. Um, he was a, he was very well known. So he said, go find Randy Gillery and tell Randy that Dave sent you. And honestly, I only did it because I didn't want to hurt his feelings. Because I thought, man, I got a job at Coca-Cola now. This is over with. So I show up at this race shop. I park. I'm like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to hum- humiliate myself anymore. So as I'm walking up to the door, there was a guy. Uh, behind one of the race trucks, washing something out. I don't know if he was washing out a trash can. I don't know what it was. He looked up at me and I said, hey, you know where I can find Randy Gillery? He said, I am Randy Gillery. I said, oh, hey, Randy. Dave Brakefield sent me and told me you guys are looking for a truck driver. He said, Dave sent you? I said, yeah. He goes, come with me. So two minutes later, 
I'm upstairs in the team owner's office uh, with uh, David Hodson, who actually started Outlets of America. Uh, and the, the minute all changes, he actually started all that. So he was pretty well known. And the team manager was Cal Lawson, who was also Alan Kuriki's team manager. So I knew who Cal was. So I'm sitting in front of these guys, and they're just small talking with me. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't tell them I drove trucks for Snyder. I wasn't going to do that at all. So I kind of fudged it a little bit and told them that I drove trucks for the uh, drag racing team. Okay. Okay. I had to. I mean, that's yeah, not. <laughs> The whole time I'm talking, I'm like, fingers crossed, going, God, if they ask me to name some, my love, they're going to know whoever the person was. So uh, two three minutes later, they handed me a team shirt, shook my hand, you're hired, started me out at more money than when I was making at Coca-Cola, and I was flying the next day to Monroe, Washington for a, uh, a truck race, and I was going to be the catch can guy. Wow. <laughs> so all the way home. When you, say, when you say catch can now for people – that don't okay. know about NASCAR. So let's talk about that. So you're on the pit crew. Right. Okay. So tell them about that. What does that mean? Catch can guy. Catch can guy. If you ever seen it, the, he or she is at the back of the car with a little can and, and you stab a probe about yay long, you know, six, seven inches long into the back of the car. And what that does, it just creates that, that, that releases that vacuum. It's just like when you're pouring gas into your lawnmower, if you don't open up that vent valve, the gas doesn't come out fast or it spills. Well, that's basically essentially what the catch can guys. So, you know, you stab it and you have to always be making contact with the can. You can never not touch the can. So even when you see the catch can guy grabbing that first can of gas, his body is still making contact with the can. You have to. Mm. So that's what I would do. You know, you stab it and you watch the catch can. And when gas starts burping into the catch can, you wave your hands in front of the gas man so he knows to stop putting gas oh, yeah. if it's a two can stop you grab you know you have it usually you have a count like oh, one thousand one one thousand two one thousand three one four and you grab the can while he or she goes and grabs the second uh can of gas so it, speed is essential in the for people that don't watch nascar racing that the how fast the the pit crew is can make or break a race for you either you you could win or lose just by that right uh 2009, I was catch can for an ARCA team, and the crew chief came on the radio and said, if we don't get a gallon of gas, at least in the car, we're not going to be able to finish the race. And the guy that was doing gas didn't know what he was doing. Bless his heart, great guy. He kept stabbing it, and he kept just burping gas all over me. Dale Waltrip standing there. It was on TV. It was embarrassing. Luckily, she, I won't mention her name, blew the motor up, over it, blew it up, coming around turn three and four at Daytona. Thank goodness she did, because if she had not done that, it would have been our fault because we would have ran out of gas. So anyway, so yeah, it's a, it's a pretty it's a pretty important job. All of them are. That EP initials for the young lady. What was it again? DP. Uh, no, okay. no, no. Okay. So, but go ahead. I, I, yeah, no, it, this was uh, I don't know, I don't mention her name because I don't even know if she's in America, but it was Anilka Duno. She's a Venezuelan driver. Okay. Beautiful lady. I fell in love with her working for her. I mean, I, I loved her. She was great. She was good to us on the team and all that. But she was nervous. It was her first time at Daytona, you know, whatever. So, um, but anyway, getting back to what I was saying. So here I am doing a pit stop. Uh, and my dad had passed away like uh, the year before. And I remember how teared up I got when the truck pulled away because I, all those nerves, all that anxiety, all that the, all that working so hard to get to a point where you can do this, and now here I am standing in the pit of a racetrack in Monroe, Washington, and it just was overwhelming. I mean, I teared up and everything. Uh, and the next day, I passed a kidney stone in the bathroom at the racetrack, which was really tough because it's like, you're the new guy on the team. Where's the new guy? We can't find the new guy. I'm in the bathroom stall passing the kidney stone. So Scott Riggs, who was our race car driver at the time, was the only guy that came and checked on me. Uh, he came in and said, what's going on? I said, dude, I just need some water. So he went and got me like six bottles of water. I drank them as fast as I could, could because I knew I needed to get it going. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a little a little uh, thumbs up to Scott Riggs because he really he came and checked on me. So thank goodness that he did, you know. And you were uh, new, so they didn't know if you were a slacker and you were making up stuff or whatever. Right, yeah. Right. But, you know, and the thing about NASCAR, and I'll be honest, this is my experience, it's kind of like that wolf pack mentality. 
you know, the weakest link gets just devoured. So the guy who makes a mistake on the pit crew is the reason for world hunger. You know, you, it's your fault for everything until the next stop comes and hopefully it's somebody else on the team. You know, and no one does makes mistakes on purpose. You know, it's like anything else, but it is it's a high profile, high pressure type situation where they're always looking to point fingers and blame somebody for something. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's a big money situation too. You yes. know, a mess up can cost a lot of money. It can it's a small mess up. Yeah, right. It can, and you know, NASCAR is such a small community, or it was back then, especially that you know, you make a mistake on Sunday, two weeks from now, people still remember you. You can't get a job anywhere if you were to be it, if they would have let you go. You know, people don't forget things like that, you know. So it was a uh, it was a lot of pressure. So that's how it started for me working for this truck team. It was actually three trucks. And uh my driver was Scott Riggs. I actually worked on the RC Cola truck, number eighty six, Craftsman truck, year two thousand, look it up. Um, Scott Riggs, Mike Cope drove it first, but Mike left and then Scott Riggs went into the truck. But I drove the hauler for Carlos Contreras, who drove the number 10 Hot Wheels truck. So I would drive the Hot Wheels hauler to and from the track, park it, give the keys to the crew chief, who was Doug George, and I would go over to the 86 truck, and I would be part of that team until the race was over. Then I was back doing the uh, the, uh, the 10 truck. So hmm. so I did that for a few months. Uh, can we keep going? Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. So I did that for a few months. And I'll be honest with you, Cal Lawson, great guy. He had a lot of pressure, but he was one of these guys. Did you, did you ever see Full Metal Jacket, how the drill sergeant treated Powell in Full Metal Jacket? Oh, yeah. That's how Cal Lawson was with me. I mean, I was in the Army, so I know what the – I mean, this guy would get in my face and yell and, and spit my – I mean, because I had several jobs. During the day, I would sit at the desk, and I would make all the airline reservations, hotel reservations, real car stuff for, them, for three teams. After five, I would go in the shop and break down tires, inner liners, all that kind of stuff, and do whatever. Uh, so I, and then I would drive the hauler. So I had multiple jobs. And he was just impossible to work for. So I basically went to lunch one day and just didn't come back. And uh, a friend of mine was working for Ricky Craven over at the 50 Cup car, Midwest Transit Racing. They had that car that had the chrome illusion paint were all different colors and stuff. Yeah. Um, they called me up. I went over there. Uh, uh, Bob Hewitt, Bonsai, awesome guy, hired me, started me out at $150 more a week than I was working on the other team, and all I had to do was cut the grass and clean the bathroom to go run parts. So I was like, yeah, I'll do that. Um, so I started doing that, cutting the grass, running parts, just sweeping up, doing whatever. Uh, and, the, and here's a shout-out to Ricky Craven. When I first started on the team, it was in the winter, just before Christmas. And I remember I was in one of the bathrooms cleaning out the toilet, I was on my hands and knees, hand in the toilet with a comment, the old-fashioned way, and all of a sudden, I just felt the presence behind me. And I turned and looked, and it was Ricky Craven, you know, a, a Winston Cup driver, right? Mm -hmm. And I stood up, and he said, hey, you're the new guy on the team. Uh, I'm Ricky Craven. And I take off my glove, my latex glove and everything, and I don't, I'm looking at my hand. He goes, that's all right. Go ahead. So I extended my hand. He shook my hand, and he handed me a bonus check for $500 for Christmas. And I'll be honest with you, without that bonus check, it would have been a really lean Christmas for the kids that year because I wasn't really, you know, I was living paycheck to paycheck, really. So uh, so that's a shout out to Ricky Craven because he may not have been the best driver, but he, he treated me pretty well. So That's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Well, so I'm, thank you, Trey. Um, so I'm cutting grass, doing whatever. Well, I get to be friends with a guy who works in the body shop. He's a great guy, country boy, tells jokes, loved Andy Griffith. Just we eat chicken wings, we go to Hooters. I mean, just a great guy. And he said, hey, did you ever think about maybe doing paint and body work? And I was like, no. He said, you know. So he took me under his wing, brought me in the body shop, and taught me how to do paint and body work. You know, I mean, so if it hadn't been for him, you know, that would have probably been the end of the line for me. Um, so when I was hired, I, I stayed with Midwest Transit Racing for about a year and a half before the team kind of went belly up. Um, Earnhardt passed away during that time while I was there. Um, and then a, a friend of mine that I worked with on the truck team had gotten in with Hendrick Motorsports. So he called me up. I was on my paper route, 2 o'clock in the morning, delivering papers on Lake Norman. He gives me a phone call. So I know you're delivering papers. He said, we need a guy to come over here and work in the body shop for about six weeks only. He said, it's a contract. They'll pay you cash per day. That's all it's going to be. It'll be extra money for you. Do you want to do it? So I said, sure. 
So at that time, Hendrick Motorsports was driving, it was the Craftsman Truck Series with um, Jack Sprague and Ricky Hendrick. And they were transitioning from trucks to bush cars. So they needed extra help to get that going. So I came on board and worked for Dennis Connor, uh, who was a famous, famous crew chief in his own right. You know, he worked with Harry Hyde and all that kind of stuff. And I, six weeks turned into 10 weeks, turned into 15 weeks. And they just kept telling me to come back every day until finally one day um, I was in the body shop. I was spray painting parts and I heard the body shop shop door close and it was Dennis Connor, the crew chief. And he had a piece of paper in his hand. He raised his hand up and he had a, had a dollar amount on it. And he always, he wouldn't say you, he would say you He would say, uh, if, would you let's come work if we can pay you this right here? And I was like, yeah. He says, go take your physical. You start tomorrow, whatever. And I was just like, Hendrick Motorsports. Oh, my God. You know, oh, my God. I just couldn't believe I'm actually working for Hendrick Motorsports, man. It was just, it was, and you're working for Ricky Hendrick and Jack Sprague and, you know, the list goes on and on. Brian Vickers, Jimmy Johnson, Jeff Gordon, uh, Boston Reed, Blake Feast, David Green, Jerry Nadeau. The list just goes on and on of, of people I had the privilege of being of being able to work with while I was there. So let's talk about that for just a moment. So people that don't know a lot about NASCAR racing, Hendrick Motorsports is the top of the top. That's like the, uh, what would a, another analogy be? That would be the Elvis of motorsports. Or the Michael Jordan, but yes, or Michael yes. Jordan of motorsports. Okay, so go ahead. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It was a dream come true, and I'll tell you what. I, I worked there. For, I was at Hendrick Motorsports for a little over six years. Matter of fact, my twentieth year would have been last year. I, I would have got my Rolex in twenty twenty two if I had still been there, because everyone gets a Rolex when you've been there twenty years. Rick Hendrick treated everyone on the team very well. The guy provided quarterly lunches for us at Christmas. We would get bonus checks, gifts, dinners. I mean, he, he showed his appreciation for us like you wouldn't believe. And if a person spent 10 minutes in a room with him, you would totally understand what his allure is, what his attraction is. Because there were times when we'd be in the body shop, me and two other guys. And, and matter of fact, when I worked at Hendrick, uh, my boss was a guy named Wade Jackson. Wade Jackson painted all the cars for Days of Thunder. Oh. Okay. And the funny thing is, some of those cars are in the Hendrick Museum. And he told he told us there was times they would work hundred hour work weeks to get the cars painted for the movie. So if you went to the museum and you knew where you were looking, you could find runs and the clear coat. So he would tease Wade about it, and he would you know he really get upset about it because that's in a museum forever to his work. That he's but anyway, great guy worked for him. Uh, and there were times we. I'm sorry, Days of Thunders was filmed in the town that you live in, by the way. Yes. Parts yes. Of it were. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, the scenes in Days of Thunder where you see the feet shifting the gears and the gas, that was Dennis Connor, my crew chief. That was that was him doing that, you know, because he actually worked worked under Harry Hyde. It was Harry Hulk. And Billy, you and I saw the, saw the barn in Lawrenceville. Yeah. Remember? I, yeah. I filmed it. I haven't put it out yet, but but you and I went to the barn. That's right. Right. That's in the um, barn. Lost my train of thought here. Where was I at? I'm sorry. So that's my uh, fault. You, you were talking about... Uh, working there and how good those guys were to you. Yes. About Rick Hendrick. Yes. We uh, think, thank, thank you for uh, yes. keeping up with that, Billy. Um, you know, it was a Wednesday night or a Tuesday night. We're in the body shop. It's two, 11, 12, one o'clock in the morning. We're working. We worked all the last weekend. We're going to be working this weekend. You're just a scrunal. Just don't want to do it no more. You're hot. You're sweaty. You're a dirt bobber. You're covered in Bondo dust from head to toe. You know, it's in your nose and everything. And all of a sudden you hear the door and you look and there's Rick Hendrick standing there in a suit and tie. And he walks up to you. He grabs your hand and shakes it. He don't care that your hands are dirty and tells you how much he appreciates what you're doing. Uh, he'd be the guy to say, hey, last time I talked to you, your mother was sick. How's your mother doing? I mean, he was that guy. Like, how could he remember stuff like that? But he would. And he would leave that building and you'd be ready to work another hundred hours. You were just you just he just completely recharged, you know, or you'd be at the racetrack and, you know, with Brian Vickers and the Kyle Bush, there were times when things just wouldn't go our way, you know, and you crash the primary and the backup. So Monday morning, you're walking in the race shop like, man, and there's Rick Hendrick in the break room. And he hands you a card with a hundred dollar bill in it saying, hey, go take your wife or your girlfriend out to dinner tonight. Don't worry about it. It's going to be OK. That's the kind of stuff he would do, you know, and I was working for Ricky during the plane crash, you know, in 2004, um, when the plane crashed, killed 10 Hendrick Motorsports people. It killed Rick Hendrick's only brother, 
It killed um, his son, Ricky Hendrick, who was who was slated to take over Hendrick Motorsports. And he was who I was working for at the time on the five uh, Bush car. Um, killed Tony Stewart's pilot, killed two Hendrick pilots. And I was good friends with one of them. His name was Dick Tracy. Actually, was his real name. Great guy. Yeah, great guy. Uh, it killed uh, his only brother, John Hendrick, his two nieces. I mean, the guy lost the next morning, we come to work, everyone meets down in the uh, museum, and Rick took the time to have breakfast catered in to all of us, even through all of that, and he made sure that we all knew, without a doubt, that Hendrick Motorsports was not closing, it wasn't going anywhere, we're here to stay, we're family, and I just, that just, just overwhelmed me that, that during all that, he still had that in him, and I found out later on that for a long time, and he may be stu- still doing it now, Every week, he would reach out and call the family members to see how they were doing, you know, and he lost his son. He lost his brother. He lost his, I mean, he lost so much at one time. So, yes, I would take a bullet for Rick Hendrick. If he needed a kidney, I'd be the first person in line to, 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 was a great guy. I never had any intentions of leaving Hendrick Motorsports, but things happened. So I did, you know. Mm -hmm. So he's just good people. That's, that's. What well, we can surmise from that. Good people, man. Just a really good guy. You know, and during our quarterly lunches, he would have like a big Plinko board like they have on the Price is Right. And if your birthday was in that quarter, they put your name in a hat and they would call you up. And man, you'd get two, three thousand dollar prizes. One guy won a trip on the Orient Express. I mean, he was giving out uh, AirPods, giving out just all this stuff. And it was funny because, like, for example, one quarter lunch we had uh, Chad Canales that got caught for doing something he wasn't supposed to be doing, cheating or whatever. You know, it was a big deal. It was in the news. It was a penalty to pay and all that. So during that luncheon, Chad Canales is there. There's 550 employees in this room. It's a big room. And he calls Chad up to pull the name out of the hat, you know, to call the employee up to whatever. And this guy, he called him out. It was his birthday that quarter. He came up and he spun the Plinko thing. And I think he won. Excuse me, a couple thousand dollars, whatever. Rick Hendrick pay, had somebody pay him the cash, and he looked at Chad and he said, Hey, Chad, he said, You know, I think if you were to pull out your checkbook and write him a check for that same amount, I think that would really go a long way, letting, letting all of us know that you're sorry for what you got caught doing. Wow. And Chad laughed, and Rick says, No, go get your checkbook, Chad. So Chad's face got red. He had to go get his checkbook. I mean, so he was a very, friendly, personable guy, but you didn't mess with him either. You know, he didn't, he didn't get to be who he, who he was and is by being too nice, you know? Right. So it was just, it was really, it, it, he was teaching Chad a lesson at the same time, you know? So, so he was uh, a great guy, man. I know the year we won the championship with Brian Vickers in 2003, and here's my 2003 that's championship that's winning right here. That, look at that. Look at that, smart guy. <laughs> It's got uh, it's got my name on the side right here. It says uh, the, it says Moss. No wait, no Moss it's on this side. Yeah, look at that. GMAC. Yeah, GMAC. It's got the number five on here. So now here's the thing about having a NASCAR ring in NASCAR country. You don't you don't wear them. You, you know everyone's got one. The guy who's pumping <laughs> gas has got two NASCAR championships. <laughs> yeah. So it's 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 cool to brag outside of NASCAR, but it's not, not in. So this was a uh, this was 2003 with Brian Vickers. Um, I was um, uh, body shop, and I drove the truck as a part time truck driver. They would like on race day, they would fly me to Michigan or New Hampshire or wherever, and I would help the truck driver get the truck back, the primary driver, so we could get back quicker to get the car turned around for the next race. So. Um, and what that's about, friends, is if you're driving a big truck, you can only drive so many hours at one time. So if you want to keep the truck rolling, you have to have a second driver. Right. Yeah. Hey, look, and Billy, I've got so many trucker stories. <laughs> I mean, some of them are pretty wild, but they're, they're, they're good. We'll have, to do, we'll have to do an episode of trucker stories. Yes, and yes. Let's, let's do that. So um, uh, let's same subject but let's talk about um i know that one of the drivers that most people would recognize that would have been at hendrick i think during the time that you were there would be jeff gordon yes okay so do you know jeff gordon yes and no like if if jeff would walk up and go hey rob what you been up to bud you know 
But I tell you, Jeff, uh, the body shop I worked in right next door was the carbon fiber department. It was actually attached to us. Uh, and Gary Dehart was over that. And if you remember, Gary Dehart was Bobby uh, Terry Labonte's crew chief when he won the championship in the Kellogg's car. You know, mm-hmm. Gary Dehart's a legend in his own right, too. So they were over the carbon fiber department because at that time, Hendrick was making their own carbon fiber seats. So they would make seats for the drivers. And sometimes we would make seats for other drivers, like Ryan Newman would come get seated uh, or get fitted for a seat. So it wasn't just Hendrick. You know, it was other drivers, too. And Jeff Gordon would come around a lot. And uh, the thing I liked about Jeff was, is if he walked into the room, he's going to speak to you first. You know, he would speak to everybody in the room, give you a genuine smile. Uh, At the racetrack, he would speak to you. Uh, And he was just a really, really good guy. He really was. Um, And I know a lot of people, you know, for a long time said a lot of things about Jeff and all that. But it absolutely is not true. Jeff Gordon loves women. (laughs) <laughs> He's a, yes, yes. All, 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 you could attest to that. <laughs> yes, I mean, it, just a great just a, stories, Rob. <laughs> Tell us some <laughs> stories. No, <laughs> yeah, there's some uh, of those stories that they're not. We can't do. <laughs> this is a no, family podcast, Rob. Right, so, it is. <laughs> but no, hey, he was a he was a good guy. You know, I wish him all the success in the world, and I think I think that I think he will run Hendrick Motorsports at, at one time or soon enough. I think he will. Yeah. And, and hopefully so. Just a, just a really good guy. When I worked for Brian Vickers, you know, Brian was – Jeff kind of took Brian under his wing a little bit uh, and helped him out a lot uh, with personal stuff, with helping him understand how the media is, you know, your fan base, the money, all that stuff that was coming at Brian as a, as a young person. Jeff uh, really helped him a lot with that. So Brian would come around and tell us, wow, you know, last night Jeff took me to this exclusive place and it was so cool and – you know, so Jeff was good to him. He really was. So, mm-hmm. and I've always had a lot of respect for Jeff, and I always will. You know, and, and Jimmy Johnson too, because the one thing about working on a team is you get to see the drivers when they're in front of the camera, and you get to see them when the camera's off. You get to see them when they win a race. You get to see them when they've lost a race. You get to see them when they've had stomach issues. <laughs> you know, their stomach. You know, you get to see all that. You get to see their fire suit. You get to see everything that happened in the race car. There were some drivers that would, uh, you'd have to paint up 50 little tree air fresheners in the race car on Monday to get the stink out of the car, mm-hmm. you know, because, you know, things happen, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I will tell you this, Jeff Gordon and Jimmy Johnson were are genuine good guys. When the fans would come around, they were very, very friendly, personable, and it was genuine. You could see the look on their face. It wasn't, it wasn't made up, you know? Mm-hmm. Now, I won't mention any names, but I've worked for lots of other drivers that, you know, so how many total have you did you work with? I was actually today, I would say between twenty and twenty five drivers, probably. And some of them I didn't work with as a driver, but they were like um uh tutoring other drivers, like Ted Musgrave. You know, Ted Musgrave uh helped. He would come on and he would help some of the drivers or whatever. Uh Jerry Nadu was another one that would help. And poor old Jerry at the time, he'd had that crash, you know, where he was messed up and he he would you know he would have to give him uh he had to give information to our secretary to uh to fly and he had a people the card out of his front pocket and handed it to her because he didn't know his phone number he didn't know his and he's better now but at the time you know he had that bad crash and ricky craven too at that time when he had that crash you know it took it took those guys a couple years to get over that you know and to get right again um but yeah, uh, I'll tell you a funny story about Ted Musgrave real quick. Ted Musgrave is salt of the earth. Like he'll go change the oil in the car, come back and eat a bologna sandwich with oil on his fingers, get oil in the bread. He don't care. Ted Musgrave just don't care. He's just a good, just get it done guy. I won't mention the driver's name, but we were uh, testing in Chicago, I think it was. And the driver was, you know, couldn't, you know, new driver complaining about how the car was set up, complaining about these tires are not right or whatever. So Ted said, bring the car in. So Ted jumped in the car, and Ted was half a foot taller than this driver. So the, the pedals were too close. It was not comfortable. Ted goes out in the car, hadn't been in the car probably in six months, and ran like six-tenths of a second faster, lap times. And he parked it and just got out of the car, and he winked at me as he went in the holler and just like, and he grabbed a banana, started eating a banana. And I just thought, <laughs> that, was a, that was a Clint Eastwood moment right there, you know? That's right. 
Well, because, that's a, a Top Gun moment, you know. Where, yes. Where, yes. <laughs> it was. It was. Yes, I just. I just loved Ted Musgrave, and and he, he was just a just a really good guy. It was a lot of fun being around him too. So. That's hey great. Rob, I um, you know, I, I go to the Talladega Speed uh, Super yes. Speedway to races, and last few times I've been able to go and uh, I watch the race in the President Suite. Wow! Because uh, I do a lot of work with the city of Talladega. Probably going next week and doing the same thing. But last race, man, I got to tell you this: I got to watch that race with Bobby and Dunny Allison. Oh wow! So I went up to Bobby Allison and I was like, "Hey, Mr. Allison, what you think about these race car drivers today?" And he looked at me. And we're watching the race. They're coming around the track. And he used some words that I can't use on this podcast. But he said, these blah, 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 blah. They ain't no race car drivers. <laughs> <laughs> he said, back in the day, coming around that turn, I flip, I flick my own brother off to pass him. He said, that was real racing. These kids don't know what racing is. <laughs> That's what uh, Bobby Allison told me at the race last time at Talladega. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, these old school race car drivers, there's nothing like them, you know? No, and, that's and, true. And I actually met Bobby Allison, too. I um, I think I've told you all this story. I was in, when I worked for Ford, we would get a lot of NASCAR tickets and stuff. So I was at the Charlotte race and we had the hospitality tent uh, stuff. So you got passes to the Ford hospitality tent. You could go back and get food or beverages or whatever. And it was all yeah. complimentary. So yeah. uh, Lori was with me and, and she, uh, she was seated. We were getting ready for the race. It hadn't started yet. And I said, well, I'm going to run back to the tent and get some beverages. So I'm, I'm going through. And what it is is a big fenced in area and there's tents on both sides. It's really wide because there's a lot of people. Yeah. And my tent, the Ford tent was the very last one on the left. And I see a guy walking towards me. And there's nobody but me and him. And this Bobby Allison, I could not believe it. Didn't have a camera, didn't have a way to get an autograph. I had nothing, no way to get a selfie. That tells you how long ago it was. <laughs> all I could do was say, oh, my God, it's Bobby Allison. That's all I could do. But that yeah. did happen. It was just me and Bobby Allison in this little, little uh, in the hospitality tent area. Well, man, it, they're just sitting there and actually watching a race, sitting beside Bobby Allison and asking him. And we're just talking, just talking and then he was telling me that he was the first ever guy to ever take a race car uh, around Talladega Super Speedway and he said that the tires were so bad they uh, he blew out like five sets of tires like every two laps because it was so rough back then and yeah. uh, and I think that first race I think Petty and them wouldn't race at Talladega if you go back in the history I, of that race I remember track that. Yep, I remember that. they all wouldn't race because mm -hmm. uh, they were scared of somebody getting killed out there. Yeah. Bobby Bobby's Allison, son, man. Davey is my favorite driver. Yes. Yep. Um, what was that number 88 Texaco? Oh yeah. Uh, they brought the car way back in. How did Yates. he die in the helicopter crash? Was that at Talladega? At Talladega. Alabama? Yeah. yeah. I thought it was at Talladega. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. died right there in infield. Man, I was heartbroken. And, yeah. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of people a lot, love Bob uh, Davey. That yeah. was a big, that was a real, you know, I was working for Ford, as I mentioned at the time. So I was real heavy into NASCAR at that time and him, him being killed. Uh, and then uh, I liked Alan Kowicki uh, at that, you know, just after that, he kind of became the driver that I, that I pulled for. He ended up getting killed. What, yep. how did Kowicki die? Um, it was a plane crash. That was a plane crash, I think. And, and then you had uh, Ernie Irvin took over the 88 ha Texaco Havlin car. So that's way back. I, I could talk a little NASCAR from that time period. I know nothing about it now. Me neither, me neither, Billy. And it, it, your, your era and the era Trey's talking about, like Bobby Allison would be at the Lowe's Hardware in Mooresville lots of times. And you'd walk in and just go, what's up, B.A.? Because you, you'd have your team shirt on, so he knew you worked for a team. He and Kelly Albrow, uh, they're just good guys, you know. Um, David Pearson is another one. He would come around a lot, and David, real quiet, he would just hang out. And those guys had more talent in their little fingers than half these guys have. They have the air conditions now. They have flavored sports drinks. And don't get me wrong, that's great to have all that. But these are guys. If you remember, you know, Richard Petty cracked his neck or whatever and, and welded a hook in the roof and held his head up. So he could drive. I mean, just think about some of that stuff those guys did. If you go in and look, it would have took his head off. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and some of the stuff, uh, you know. And this is another funny story. Before I got into NASCAR, I was working for Coca Cola, like I told you guys. My buddy was driving the hauler for Dave Marcus, 
Martinsville had gotten rained out on a Sunday, so they were going to run it on Monday. So I get a knock on my door Sunday Sunday afternoon, and I look, and there's Dave Marcus's hauler in front of my house, and it was twice the size of my house. It, the neighborhood was not designed for that, so I don't know how he got it in there, but it was a huge truck. He said, come on, let's go to Martinsville, man. I want you to do this, because he felt bad, because he was the reason why I had moved to Mooresville in the first place, and I just wasn't having any luck with it. So I remember he snuck me in the track. We're at Martinsville. The, the lift gate's down. The trucks have been rolled out. It's Monday morning. The sun's out. There's not many people around because everybody had good work after the rain delay. And I'm standing at the back of the hauler. And all of a sudden, Richard Petty walks past me, cowboy hat and everything. And he looks at me and goes, how you doing, son? And I just, just, it'd be like Elvis, it'd be like Elvis speaking to you. You know, he spoke to me first. Oh, my, I'm just a guy. St-. And so tons of respect for Richard Petty. Always have and always will have, you know. As well. Rob, listen, listen to my Richard Petty story. Okay. So, uh, 2007, 18, I go to his museum and it's, it's, I'm in there. Another person, about two other people are in there, just like us three. I'm back there at the very back looking at his cars. They have like some of his cars set up in the, on display back there. Right. It's just me back there. And I'm looking at his car. And the next thing I know, a door opens right behind me. I, I turn around and Richard Petty comes walking through that door in his cowboy hat and his sunglasses. And I'm standing there in his car and I'm like, Mr. Petty, you know, and, and I was like, man, which one of these is your favorite? He stood there and t- showed me which one was his favorite car. It was like one of the old real ra- vintage, like late 60 cars that he won, uh, I think, at Daytona. And man, yeah. I'm standing there with Richard Petty in his museum. No one's around. And we're talking about his race cars. I mean, Trey, that's cool. Trey, you've got the life, man. How does that stuff happen to you all the time? That's yeah. great. And the door just opened and Richard Petty came walking through. And, man, I got a cool picture with him. That's I cool. Met, oh, my, dad, my dad's yeah. a big NASCAR fan. He, he loved it. You know? Yeah. I met Richard in 72 or 73. He was oh, at wow. a Dodge dealership in Greenville, North Carolina. Okay. Signing, signing postcards. Yeah. I, oh, I, wow. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I still have the postcard. But I was a kid, seven or eight years old. But, yeah. man, you know, as a kid, he was the person when you thought of NASCAR racing. He was the guy. He yeah, was absolutely, the guy. he was. Hey, and, yeah. and uh, Michael Jordan—that—that's Jordan's favorite race car driver. Was Petty. is it really? And I think in his museum he had something of MJ. I think that MJ had given him you know, on display. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, man, that's so cool. Okay, I want to ask you this, Rob, because we have a few more minutes. What is your favorite moment of your career? What is what? What happened? What's that favorite moment? Something you did during a race, or whatever. Honestly, this right here. ARCA championship, ARCA, okay, ARCA's guys wear T-shirts and smoke cigarettes in the car. It's old school. I worked for Shelter Motorsports uh, in 2009 and 10, and this was the championship in 2010. And that by far was my most favorite because I was so involved with the team. Uh, the, the family treated me like their son. They really, truly would have adopted me if they could have. Um, I miss them. I love them dearly. They're great people. And that was probably my most favorite because I, I was so, so, so much involved. You know, Hendrick, he got 550 some odd employees. Everybody has a, has a deal, but with shelter, I had, I wore 20 hats and I loved it, you know? So that, that's probably my most favorite memory. Yeah. Thanks for asking that, Trey. So well, it's just uh, cool to learn about your story and seeing like how you got into it and it kind of just trickled down like an, an effect but all I guess what I'm saying is you you had to struggle. You had yeah. to struggle with your decision to leave everything you had to go after this dream. And that's usually how dreams are. You got to struggle. Yeah. And, and, and real quick, real quick, for 10 seconds, I'll say this. 50 percent of the of all this was me. The other 50 percent of more was people that looked out for me. You know, if, if the guy hadn't called me on the phone at one o'clock in the morning, and say, hey, man, we need some help in the body shop. I thought about you. Uh, I never forgot them. You know, they, they, they're the ones that stuck their necks out for me. Without them, I would still be, you know, that guy in Louisiana doing nothing. So That's relationship. So you have two more rings that you hadn't shown us. You have four championships total. So while you're t- showing us those two rings, tell us how or why you got out of NASCAR. Um, Let me see. Honestly, I, I missed it. Uh, honestly, um, 2008, you know, when, when it happened, with the, with the economy and everything. Um, a lot of teams were cutting out the fat. Sponsors were pulling pulling out of the, the business. When I was in during the beginning, a sponsor just wanted to be on the car. And they would give you, like, Budweiser, or we had Spectracide. They would give you fertilizer, beer, 
do anything you want. And then toward the end, it got to be where the sponsors actually controlled the sport. They dictated what the teams did, more or less. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't the way it was before. Before, they were just happy to be a part of a team. Yeah. And it just it kind of evolved. So what happened was you had guys making $150,000 plus a year now making half that and doing twice the work. And it just uh, it just was a bad time in the sport. It, it just was. And so I, I got out of it for, for a couple years. So you saw it change. You saw it become what it has become today. It, it was it was starting to go that way. It really was. And honestly, I've had I've had several people call me not not in the last ten years, but there were lots of times guys would call me to work on a Formula One team or a, an IndyCar team as a truck driver and stuff. The pay was great, but it's just, it's a hard life. You know, it cost me my marriage. Um, you're always gone. It's just it, you get old before your time. You know, and I was already in my mid forties when I worked on my last team and most of the guys on the team were Trey's age or younger, you know? So I had to try twice as hard, work out twice as much to stay physically in shape enough to compete with them. And it just, it just got to be a little bit too much, you know? Well, you, t- you took care of business as uh, somebody else you like would say, Rob, you did mm-hmm. TCB it. You made it happen. TCB it, man. But the whole point of this thing is friends, Rob set out to work for NASCAR and he did and work for, arguably one of the lar- the largest team probably in NASCAR. Um, so congratulations, man. I know it cost you some things, but thank you, you did. You got your dream. You sure I did. did. I and did. We'll, we're going to bring you back for another episode. We'll talk about uh, some of these truck driving things and some other stuff. So friends, we're a little bit over time. Thank y'all so much for listening. Uh, tighten up every chance you get. Don't globe trot. Don't double dribble. Don't double dribble. Okay. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Trey. Love you guys, man. Thank you all so much. Love you. Yes, sir.